We remember music long after we've forgotten pretty much everything else. There's a pretty good chance you've experienced something called involuntary musical imagery, which often manifests itself as that tune you can't seem to get out of your brain. As I was doing research for this video, I found it really interesting that this was often cast in a negative light in several of the articles that I was reading, and that started to make more sense in the context of those with OCD, who can easily find themselves in an almost torturous earworm feedback loop. But then I realized, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a composer, and we composers tend to approach the entire subject from a slightly different perspective. For us, the question isn't really, how do I get this song out of my head? It's more along the lines of, how do I write something that people will actually remember? During my amateur YouTuber research time, it became clear that music is an incredible tool for memorization. And I think most of us can remember songs that we learned as children that were used to deliver information in some sort of way that we would remember. And eventually, as we get older, that comes full circle, and even patients with Alzheimer's disease can still remember melodies and lyrics associated with melodies when they've even forgotten their own loved ones in some cases. Now, a lot of these reasons given are extra musical, in other words, something attached to the music other than the music itself, like lyrics or visual stimuli or even an emotional imprint that we sort of associate with a piece of music. In fact, we can often recall exactly what we were doing and where we were when we first heard a specific piece of music with almost hyper-realism vividness. There is, however, one purely musical device that composers have been utilizing for centuries that seems to stick with us long after we've forgotten pretty much everything else. Melody. There's probably a really good reason why John Williams, for instance, chose to write a very specific, distinctive theme for every character in Star Wars, and why we remember all of those themes so vividly and associate them with those characters as soon as we see them. But it's a bit easier said than done, and if you've ever tried to write a melody yourself, you're probably aware that it's a fine line to walk between writing something that's incredibly highly memorable and really cliche and something that's been done a million times. First of all, I think we need to clearly define what a melody is, because not all music contains melody, and that's not a judgment, not all music needs to contain a melody. And it's also true that modern film scoring and some other musical genres that are more recent have kind of abandoned melody and uh, almost look at it as taboo at this point. It definitely seems to have fallen out of style just a little bit. Also with the advancement of sound design and production, it's easy to fall in love with texture and achieving contrast and memorability and characteristics that way. But while it may be a little bit out of style today, there is absolutely no denying its effectiveness. I also think that there's maybe a little something to be said for embracing the things that have fallen out of style a bit, or maybe considered old-fashioned, because when you do that, at some point, you're the one who sounds like you're doing things that are new and innovative and interesting, because you're not following the pack of what everyone else is doing. So what is a melody in the way that we'll define it today? Well, it's usually a single line that follows some sort of a linear progression and tells a musical narrative. And like any good story, it has a shape and inflections and maybe even a plot twist or two. And there are a couple devices that we can use in our melodies as composers to achieve this sort of musical storytelling. Welcome to my living room. It's much more echoey. Echo. First, we can make sure that our melody is singable. We tend to remember things that we can sing or hum along with. That's an example of a singable melody. An example of a not-so-singable melody might be something like... Good luck singing that. To put this in less abstract terms, use smaller intervals, stepwise motion, especially at the beginning of your melody. And keep in mind that the typical range for the human voice is probably around an octave and a half. But we do want our melody to tell a musical narrative, as we mentioned, right? So we need to make it feel like it's unfolding. And to do that, it needs to have some sort of a shape to it. If we repeat the same note too many times, it can sound like our melody isn't really going anywhere. Can 
can see I've really hammered on that D natural up there. Kind of centers the melody around that note. And it can start to sound a little circular, kind of the same way if you're an author or a writer and you use the same descriptive words too many times. The reader gets a little bored because they've already heard that, they've already been there. They want something new to experience. So we've got our singable line. It's all stepwise motion or thirds, small intervals. But now we need some kind of a plot twist to make things more interesting the second time. Maybe that's the first statement of the melody. We can add emphasis or these kind of, as I'm calling them, plot twists to our melody through leaps and placing those leaps in really strategic locations. So the second time, what if we tried something like So I've got a big leap in there that kind of came out of nowhere. We weren't expecting it. It kind of propels the melody to the next level, and uh, the listener was kind of caught unaware by it, but hopefully pleasantly surprised. So let's listen to those two phrases together as one melody. Very singable, has a very specific plot twist that we really didn't see coming, so it feels like it's developing and going somewhere. There are cicadas outside singing along. Music is largely about contrast and putting those contrasting moments in very strategic locations through trial and error. So the moment you do the opposite of whatever you've established, in this case, I've established that we're doing small intervals. The moment I do something that's against the grain, put a large leap in there, it's going to stand out. And it's still singable. You can still sing this melody, but it has a unique element now that's going to help you remember it. Continuing with this exploration of contrast, we can use rhythmic contrast to add points of interest and emphasis as well. Typically, we want the melody to start kind of more conservatively and then build to a climax towards the end. And we can do that by shaping it with our rhythm. So in this case, you can feel that rush of energy that goes into that moment where I put the rhythmic interest. It also leads to the highest note, which is a point of emphasis. But everything isn't moving at the same speed all the time. It isn't all eighth notes or all quarter notes or something that's going to eventually bore the listener. The listener is going to appreciate those moments to slow down, pull back the reins, catch their breath when you've just taken them on this little eddy of current with the rhythm. And it also provides that sort of natural sentence structure like we have when we speak. Not every word is said in an evenly spaced out monotone fashion. And you've probably heard some speakers like that in the past, and you probably don't want to write your music that way. So if everything is always happening, nothing is really happening. Nothing stands out to us. There's no contrast in that melody. We need moments of intensity to fully appreciate the moments of calmness and vice versa. You may be noticing that a lot of melodic ideas have a sort of conversational characteristic to them. The phrases kind of have a natural inflection that's similar to the way that we talk to one another. This is often described as question and answer or call and response or period structure really doesn't matter what you call it. The point is, it's meant to communicate music in the same way that we communicate the spoken word. It has its peaks, it has its valleys, it has inflection, it has shape, it has a direction to it that keeps the listener interested. Sometimes a phrase will have an upward inflection at the end that sounds incomplete, and that's probably where the term question comes from. And it's usually followed by a phrase that sounds more like a statement or a conclusion, resolution to that question. 
And since it's the way that we communicate with one another, it kind of makes sense that that's the sort of thing that we would remember and would stick with us for a long time. But wait a minute, we, we've just broken this melody down into smaller pieces or chunks. So it seems like melodies are kind of modular in nature. So they have these smaller parts to them that make up the whole. And we can probably also swap the order of those phrases around and experiment with different arrangements of those little phrases, micro phrases, if you wanted to call them that. So what we think of as one complete melody actually has several smaller chunks. And if you've ever memorized a phone number, you can probably see where I'm going with this. Chunking is the process in which the brain takes a large amount of information and breaks it down into smaller, more memorable chunks. It's much easier for us to process information that way. When you pair this sort of phrase chunking with well-placed repetition of ideas that are really strong, which you have to choose through the composer's taste and experience and trial and error and all of the things that make composition what it is, then you have the beginnings of a melody that's going to stick with your listener in all of the best ways. So to put this in way too simple terms, melodies use a lot of the devices that our brains naturally use to remember things. So it stands to reason that when we've forgotten everything else about a piece of music, the melody generally will stick with us. And while they might not be in style in most genres anymore, I think there's a lot to be said for going against the grain and looking back to things that have stood the test of time, even though they might not be used very often today, especially in an age in which music is being released at an alarming rate. <laughs> and while that's a great thing that people are creating a lot of music, it also means that it's harder to stand out. And if you do things that other people aren't doing and you do those things really well, there's a better chance that you will stand out. If you'd like to learn a bit more about my compositional process and philosophies on things, you can download a free ebook, free composition guide in the description below. It's absolutely free and uh, kind of encompasses some stuff that I learned both through my classical training and in my experiments with electronic music, marrying those two things together. My next video is actually going to be about chord progressions, which is a question that I actually get asked about quite a bit and specifically how we can incorporate some of these exact same techniques that we use to create interesting melodies into our chord progressions to make them more interesting and memorable as well. Once that video is done, it's gonna reside right here in the end screen of this video, but for now, if you'd like to see that video, you can subscribe to the channel. Thanks as always for watching. Go write some melodies, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Thank you.